Hello, my name is Josh, and today I'd like to talk to you about how do we store information. Now, for the longest time, people stored information through oral tradition. And we're talking hundreds of years ago at this point. And a great way to consider this is the game of telephone. The game of telephone is a really good example of why we shouldn't do this anymore. So, it starts out, and it usually happens in a classroom. And there's different nodes. These are different people. And they're all going to pass a message around. I went to the bus station. Might be how it starts here. I went to the station. I went to the train station. I'm getting on a train. And you can see how the message changes very subtly as time goes on. Oral tradition is really good for remembering things that hit us emotionally. Parts of our brain are really adapted for that. However, brains are squishy and um, this isn't a great way to archive information beyond hundreds of years. And it, it has been shown that, you know, certain groups of people that these oral traditions can be passed down. In fact, if you read many books, um, uh, very like old religious texts, they have this oral tradition kind of like baked into the text because back then that's how the stories got around. And when you raised a kid, you would tell them these, these stories that were important to your culture. Um, however, this isn't a perfect system of storing information. And we're gonna get on to the next thing of that. So if I want to remember something correctly and I wanna tell it to someone who may not be within a circle, who may be far away, it, it's a really good time to write it down. Um, once it's in writing and we all know the alphabet and we all know English or whatever language you speak, this message doesn't change. Writing is really good for that. And this is a great way to store information. However, there's a lot of people in the world and I can only write so much. So this wonderful thing called the printing press came along in the 18 whatevers. Great invention, really good time. We get to mass produce textbooks. We get to share information. It was the first time that the uh, it was like the first wave of the information age. Before that printing press came along, we had to have people manually copy books. And that is kind of a crazy time because sometimes writing is hard to read. I'll give you an example. I'll write my name in cursive. There we go. That's normal for me. It's pretty amazing. However, this could be an I. This could be an E, a U, or any, any vowels, and your guess is as good as mine on what this last letter best represents. So, uh, all that said, handwriting has its issues as well. And as books were copied again and again, certain letters can change. And you can even see this with the English language in that certain pronunciations of words gradually change over time. So this is, still has that problem of the oral tradition where things subtly change over time. And I think it's really important to get to a world where information is stored in a lot better, in a lot more of a permanent medium. So the successor to this whole book thing and the whole writing thing that we do is, um, if you haven't guessed already, it's computers. But I just wanted to give a brief backstory on how we got here because this is hard to read and my teacher said I had to do this because only college professors would accept cursive and it was all a massive scam. But we're going to we're going to move on to computers. So the first computers came around in 50s, 60s. That's where I'm going to start here. And specifically a machine called the ENIAC. So the ENIAC did something really weird. And I had recently finished a book called The Computer and the Brain by John Von Neumann. It was a book written in the last month of, of his life. And he, as he reflects on the computer and how it relates to the brain, very big obsession with that there. However, computers now are crazier and they're different and they're awesome. But in his days, they were not reliable. And one of the problems was that 
when they put data into the computer, they were dealing with things like punch cards, vacuum tubes, and what I found most fascinating was actually how they were storing a single number. This is kind of crazy, but follow with me here. You have 10 circles. These might be like 10 vacuum tubes or whatever. Let's shorten it to five. And um, this wasn't even just 10 vacuum tubes. It might've been like 30 or something for you know, redundancy or whatever. And the way they were storing numbers was um, not in our binary way, but um, if we had a, a five number thing and I wanted it to denote four, I would have a positive charge on this and the rest of them be blank. And that, that was just the number four. And in some instances, they would fill all these banks up, and this is number four. Now, if you're a computer scientist, you're gonna look at this and be like, oh, that's not how you do it. Well, that's not how you do it nowadays. However, this is kind of where it started. And um, take these punch cards, they weren't very reliable. Sometimes they would jam, sometimes they would read the wrong input. But this was a whole lot better system than writing because with writing, we can still copy it. We can still like copy our punch cards. However, this implies a little bit more permanence because eventually we were able to store this in flash memory or non-volatile memory. And nowadays that comes in the form of a chip or a card or um, <laughs> DVDs or a hard disk. Anyways, it's all stored electronically. Once we turn off the computer, we're still gonna remember what this number is. And that's cool. That is a huge succession to the book. A book is big and it's annoying and it makes your back hurt in college. So when you don't have the book and you can just put it on something that just remembers, it's a pretty big improvement. This is a great way to store information. So once we have a new medium, which is gonna be this flash storage, I'm just gonna you know, imagine it's a little box. We put information in and it remembers it. This is really useful but we need to all agree upon certain ways to interpret it. So when I read that information, I need to make sense of it. Um, you remember the letters thing earlier. I had, I'd written down letters and you're able to read this as a word because you have some grasp of English. If you can't read it, it says remembering and interpreting. And interpretation of a language is very important for making any sense of it. And when we put it on the new flash medium, we have to create new protocols. And the weird protocol I brought up earlier was those five circles and um, just that position in the circle and, and trying to remember what that is. Not a great way to make computers, really not, especially when you don't have advanced tools like AI and whatever to build them now. Back in the you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, they were really smart people working on this. Transistors were just coming out. This non-volatile memory was just evolving from the punch card. Even some systems had like a hybrid between like punch cards and you know whatever tape decks. Computers are getting really good at remembering stuff and the amount of data kept increasing. There were different ways and more standard ways to interpret stuff. Big openly available programming languages like Fortran and I think C was well, starting to be a thing back at the time. Fortran, big big thing there. And I think COBOL was another one. People had programming languages. They had standard ways to interpret this new medium. And they were able to make sense of that information. I want to go back to our telephone game from earlier. As we had a circle, everyone interpreted a little bit different message. And that's partially due to our brains. However, this same phenomenon can occur in computers as well. Normally a signal in a computer is, um, so if you have, uh, you know, your voltage plus minus a high signal is going to mean a one and a low signal is going to mean a zero. And it has to be a low because we have to put something through it or we just assume it's not working. And this is really good. This is an amazing concept. And let me tell you why it's really good. If we did plus and then did it, we did like a high negative of 
this probably isn't going to work for a lot of stuff that we use because transistors are funny funny acting and there's also you know we don't want the wrong voltage to get in there so this isn't going to work down here back to up here we have a high and we have a low we could theoretically put in a middle one so now we're able to store three parts of information in a single um, you know, packet of communication really cool stuff and this could be expanded now we have five we can even have six however computers are finicky and let's say any given second my computer has a hiccup capacitor goes and the information has a sudden burst in voltage so now instead of one we're now at four but it's really not even four it's like four and a half so how do we look at that four and a half and decide is that a five or a four and in reality it's actually a one but just going back to that a five and a four we don't know what one it is and there's little chance for error and as computers got faster and faster these lines kept getting messier and messier and the time to read it kept getting like slower and slower and this just wasn't really good to put a bunch of stuff on one single line so the high and the low model it fit, it's stuck, it's what we use today to store information. Okay, so now we have our high and a low. It's a one or a zero, it's binary. It's not like our one through 10 number system. Binary is on or off. And we can represent that with blue square or a red square. Now, sometimes this information gets flipped and that's a problem. Information getting flipped or becoming the wrong information can be very bad. It can be very bad. Now, I can give you pretty extreme examples of, you know, a healthcare system or x-ray machine or, or whatever else that is very important to our biological life. However, just consider the computer as a machine for a second. And when the machine isn't able to reliably do its job, we would consider that broken or faulty. If my toaster only sometimes made toast and sometimes didn't work, it would be a problem. Same for my coffee maker, especially for my coffee maker. I would throw it away so quickly. And it's no surprise that scientists were very frustrated with this phenomenon that was occurring. Sometimes the blue would turn out red. And sometimes the red would turn out blue. Not a really good machine to build especially when there's big customers at the time, like the Social Security Administration, or I don't know, the IRS, and anyone else who's calculating millions of records, just to have any one of them records mess up is a big problem. It might result in millions of dollars lost, lives lost, whatever. I don't need to convince you that this is a bad idea, but I at least want you to be able to visualize it. So how do we fix this problem? of red becoming blue and blue becoming red, or blue becoming red or red becoming blue. I'm actually not even sure. Computer wouldn't be sure either. If I suddenly switch the high to a low, the computer can tell that a change had occurred. And these changes do happen. There's a thing up in the sky, it's really bright, and sometimes it has a hiccup. And it spits out these weird particles that get in this flash storage, this new medium that I talked to you about earlier. And it makes a one a zero, or it makes a zero a one. And there's actually a really cool study done in the 70s by IBM, and they were trying to figure out what's causing this. And the only thing that really fixed it was putting a computer like way down in the sea and encasing it in co concrete. Now, that's not a really good computer model to have. Um, given that most data centers are above ground and in a warehouse, uh, I don't think that uh, the whole underwater computer thing caught on. Although it sounds pretty sick, like very cyberpunk thing, like, you know, all the data centers in the ocean. Um, anyways, what was I saying? Oh yeah, remembering. 
Apparently I'm not very good at remembering. How do we get a computer to remember well? Um, so I have one or a zero. And I think colors are gonna be a really good explanation here because how do I remember that this is blue and this is red? Well, one thing you can do is copy it. So now I have two reds and I'm pretty sure it's red. Now if I look at my memory and I see two reds, that's a pretty good sign. But what if I try that with the blue and instead of a blue, I end up with a red. Now I'm looking at my memory and I'm like, okay, the first one was blue, but the redundant value was red. Did I write the redundant value wrong or was the original value wrong? You can't tell. The only thing that this tells you is that something is wrong. And this is just for a single thing. Imagine if you have hundreds of data. This also isn't very scalable because suddenly I've made your data set twice as big without storing any, actual, any more actual data. Not very good. Now, another thing that could happen is these could be stored in pairs. So now we have a blue block and we have a red block. And that's very nice. And I can make another value that says, oh, this, this, is, this is purple. That's easy. So now I'm doing a math and I'm deriving something from that. And I'm making it purple. Just imagine purple, these colors mixing, being purple. And now I've created a purple box. Um, well, it's purple. Uh, we have an issue. What if both of these change? What if instead of this, now it is red, blue, instead of blue, red? That's a problem. Um, this whole purple thing isn't really working out. Um, not good. And also, you know, on the whole two thing, we could have two blocks. If we have two red, we could store it as red. I don't know why I'm writing red, I have red. Or if I have two blue blocks, I would have, a, I could create a third thing to derive from these two blue blocks, a blue block. And I can derive two red blocks into a red block. It really makes sense. However, this whole purple thing kind of breaks this from ever being actually useful. Because while having two is rare, it is still a possibility. Now you would be able to detect if one of these had changed in this situation. So back to my red block, if one of these turned into a blue block, I had a blue block and a red block, I should have a purple block that is derived from these two blocks. And it's a red, so I know something is wrong. Something is wrong. What do we do when something is wrong? Well, we have to fix it. And in this situation of the purple block, I can't fix it. That's a problem. Um, over here, I mean, I could say that, you know, this is, this is red. I could fix that, but I'm not really sure because in this situation where I have two red blocks and one of them is blue for some reason, well, this should be purple. This isn't purple. So this is wrong or this is wrong. You can't tell with the information given. Now you are able to tell because I drew all this out and you didn't see me modify any of this. But when computers put memory away into DRAM, flash storage, or it, it doesn't have to be volatile or non-volatile. This is just like computers can break. And it's really a big problem when you have these errors. Now, I actually had a computer that had gone through this. So back in the, I think 80s and 90s, there was something wrong with RAM and computers would do something called parity checks. They would use this exact same process. So I had a computer in the early 2000s and I played a game called SimCity and it was fun. But what killed the mood sometimes is sometimes this blue screen would show up and it said my computer had parity errors and I should save my data right now as a different file name and restart my computer. 
So what my computer had done is it had looked at the blocks in my computer and it had checked them all for parity. It does this all the time whenever it accesses information, whenever it stores it, whenever it reads it, especially when it reads it because most of the time data is just sitting there. So when it read it, it had four blocks. You know, we're, we're just gonna say four blocks. In reality, they might've been um, 16 bits or eight bits or 32 bits, depending on however that memory was packaged into the DRAM. And it usually depended on the DRAM specifically because it would have an extra chip that stored all the values that we're gonna calculate right now. And now I use the word calculate, there's no math involved, please don't run away. So I have a four block thing. I have to create a way to check if there's an error in this block whenever I read it. And an easy way to do that is um, what's called odd parity, or I don't even know that that's a real name. But just think about even and odd numbers for a second. Get that in your brain, concept one, three, five. I don't know why I started with odds. Those are always the hardest. But imagine an imaginary block over here. We don't know what it is yet, but they're all over here. They're all hanging out. We need to figure out a value to put in them. I can start with blue. I, it doesn't matter. We can start with blue. Blue, blue. These are the same. It's red. So I should make it red. And now this is blue, so I should make it blue. Um, that's not really useful. It's not very useful at all. So if I start with a value of blue, and I'll say every time I run into a red, I will change it. So blue, blue, I have it. So this is gonna turn into red and then blue. So this ends up with a red. Let's just keep that same pattern in mind. So I have a block that starts blue and if we run into a red block, it changes. So we ran into a red block. Now this imaginary blue block turned into a red so it turns into a red. I'm coming in, I end up with red. And I come in here, I end up with blue. Because I can't change it into a third color, so I might as well just go back to blue. And then I come in here and it changes to red again. And then over here, it changes back to blue. So now I have blue. Back here, so it's blue. So I still retain that blue. I hit a red. I hit a blue block. And now I hit another red block. And now we do that. And we are creating, in the process, something called a parity bit. So whenever I read this data and I pick up this block, I will, you know, I'll pick up four red blocks. And I'll look at those red blocks and be like, hey, whatever's here should be blue. Because I just read those four blocks and there is not an odd number of red blocks. If you haven't noticed, if there's an odd number of red blocks, we'll end up with a red over here. This had one red block, and if I had changed this to red, we would end up with blue, red, blue, and then back to red. So we would end up with red over here. But that's not red, and um, it's just tracking that, odd, whenever it's an odd number of a value, either a one or a zero, an odd number, we end up with a high value over here, we end up with red. This is a really useful thing to check for parity. However, it has its problems. While it can detect if I change one, such as right here, if I change this, and you know, we've gone over that, it was an odd number of reds, so we should end up with red. Oh, we don't have red, that's a problem. Um, I know there's a problem, but I can't fix it. And let me tell you why I can't fix it. Because this has four different values in it. I don't know what one messed up. Also, this could have been written wrong because this is still constrained to the medium of flash storage or DRAM or hard drives or whatever. So I don't know that something's wrong, but something is wrong here. 
if one of these bits, if one of these blocks changes colors. So I've detected something with parity errors, but I can't fix it. So yeah, computers never changed again after that. So we're gonna create something called a matrix, matrix, matrices, use whatever word you wanna do with it. But what this is gonna consist of is, um, you can think of like an XY graph where we even put values in here, but except there's already values in here. Um, actually, XY graph is not a great parallel at all. Um, we're creating a matrix and it's gonna have values in it. And these values are gonna make sense here, but I'll fill them in. Okay, so now we have our matrices. Matrices, we have our parity. Go back to parity. Yeah, forget I even said the word matrix. I hate it, it's complicated. I don't even think it's English actually. I mean, not, not, not trying to be mad if you're not English. I mean, go for it, I mean. Back to the tutorial. Uh, over here, parodies. So this is an odd number of red blocks We're made red. Over here, parodies again. So over here, odd number of red, red. Odd number of red, red. Odd number of red, yes. And I messed that up. So this is actually red. I know I messed that up. What if a computer saw me and I messed that up? Um, yeah, I mean, what if my computer stored that? Because this goes back to the problem of computers aren't perfect. And I don't think a lot of storage mediums are perfect and we're delving into that. So this is wrong, but how do, we, how do I know it's wrong? Well, I just looked at these odd ones and I know that this state is correct. I just wrote it. One, two, three, I end up with an odd number of red squares. So this should be red. But how can a computer, computer's gonna look at that and be like, hey, something is wrong here. Something is wrong. Now I can look over here and I can double check all my values on this side. So do I have an odd number of red? No. Do I have an odd number of red? Yes. Do I have an odd number of red? No. I know that all of these values are correct. And I know that this value is wrong. And hear me out here. If all of these values are correct, all of these are correct, then this one has to be wrong. Because I've checked this row of data three different times, three different ways. And the only way that this can like mess up, you would think, is if there was like two errors, like before. Remember when we made purple paint out of the two values? Now, what if, you know, these two values were switched? It's really not a good example, but let's, go, let's revisit the purple paint problem. So I'm gonna fix this. We know this is red. Now all the values in this table are correct. What if I change this? What if I change it to blue? Well, is there an odd number of reds? Yes, this value is wrong. Let's go back up here. Is there an odd number of reds? One, two. No, no, there's not an odd number of reds. So this value is wrong. And it's really easy to just pinpoint, you know, we're gonna create an X through our matrix and whatever value is in the center here, this is wrong. However, if there was two things wrong in this row, this is, this is where it gets weird. If there's two things wrong in this row, now, there, now this value is correct. This value is wrong and this value is wrong. So this is wrong. And it checks this, one, two, and two, that's correct. So now if I have two over here, if I have two rows that have a problem, and I have one row up here, something has happened, and that is also a memory error. This is a two block memory error. Now data being corrupted in a series is actually pretty common. 
If you ever think of a CD, it has circles and there's certain ways to like scratch a CD where a whole circle can be messed up and the surrounding circles are not messed up. Um, that's an example. Um, in a hard drive, there can be something called a head crash. A head comes down on the hard drive and it scratches a perfect circle around it. So now we, you know, you have adjacent data that has been corrupted. What I'm trying to say is stuff can happen. Also, the sun can have a hiccup any single time and spit out more of these whatever particles at us and cause two blocks of memory to change values. So in this scheme, and there's actually RAM modules that go into this, and I'll talk about that in a second, but in this scheme, two rows are not right. And one column is not right. I don't know what these correct, these values are supposed to be because all I know is something in this row is wrong. I don't know what one is wrong. And I know that something in this row is wrong. And this might even think that everything's right, actually. So if there was, if it was red and no, I think it's right. What I'm trying to say is this can fix one error, but it can only detect when two errors have occurred. This is a very useful system. In fact, this is what's used in a lot of modern computer systems today. If you ever have error correcting code memory, usually cost a lot more, ends up on these premium motherboards. However, that memory is able to do this whole weird block switching process in real time. It really helps. And uh, yeah, so we've talked about blocks. However, if you have one computer system and it breaks, that's a problem. So let's expand this way to remember and store and archive information beyond our single bit of memory here. Let's expand this into the computer system. All right, so we stored everything perfectly on our hard drive and now we have our error correcting RAM with that extra two things to check our columns and our rows. Um, just gonna call it all ECC. We're gonna charge 20 more, 20 more dollars for this component. Now I have reliable data with integrity. However, the sun isn't the only thing that messes up our data. The sun occasionally, as I said earlier, spits out these weird rays that tend to flip a bit. However, the sun can also cause inclement weather. As I'm experiencing right now outside, it is raining. So inclement weather can cause something called lightning to cause your hard drive to catch fire. This is fire. Fire, big fire. Fire is bad. Fire is bad for electronics. It tends to melt what has been melted in a perfectly crafted way. It tends to erase data, blow up stuff, not good. So how do we fix this? Okay, now that we've identified that having it, all of our data on a single component is bad, why don't we just have two of those components? That's fine, right? So in my computer, I'm gonna put in two of these things. I have two, th two of these hard drives in my computer. Well, you remember the whole fire thing from earlier, we never really solved that. But a lot of people use this two hard drive thing to create redundancy. You know, to a potential extent, you can mitigate stuff like fire and electricity. We can install lightning rods and all of that's great. However, what if there is a problem where someone stole our computer? That's a problem. What if our place burnt down again from an even bigger fire? So, 
both of these hard drives can potentially break. However, I'll say that if one of these hard drives is good and the other one is bad, you still have your data and copy it again, get back to work. Companies do this all the time. However, if you're a bigger company and you know, sometimes your whole box goes down because bad things happen, why don't we just copy all of this? Why don't we just have a whole nother system with its own hard drives? And now we are getting into enterprise level data integrity. So create your backups on, this can even happen in real time with something called a RAID. So on my original box, I can copy both of this data. This guy can go away, it'll be fine. I'll still have it here. There's solutions to copy it to a whole different set data center. Now, if you don't have a couple data centers at home like me, you can just take your computer, copy it onto a external hard drive. So that's a hard drive outside of here. There you go. You can give that a friend, bury it, mail it halfway across the world. You're fine. This is how a lot of people should store their data. And I'm going to create a video soon about what do you do when your data is broken. If you're just having a hard drive and it breaks, it falls on the ground. If you're like, if you're like me, you're working on a computer and boop, oh no, there's the three terabyte hard drive on the kitchen floor. Uh, I'll do a video on that. But however, it's really important that you store it in a second place. You, if you're like a personal user and throw all your stuff on a flash drive, do that, copy your data and put it in someone else's like fire safe or whatever. You can encrypt it, put a password on it or whatever. You're not going to lose a lot of security that way, but you can give it to someone else or you can bury it. Some people bury it in their backyards. Not my deal, but whatever. Keeping that data in a separate place, really useful. And using all those techniques from before of error correcting code, super useful. Once you have that data integrity on the component, it's easy to copy that component. And it's easy to send that component elsewhere and separate it you know, geographically and also network wise. Also, components nowadays are amazing. We've come a long way from the ENIAC system back in the 50s and 60s, whatever, whenever they made it. I think it might have even been the 40s. I don't know, it was really old, kind of classified at the time. So who knows? Computer go burr back then. Components nowadays, they're really amazing. I can go out and buy a server level hard drive that lasts for 10 years. As long as I don't drop it on the kitchen counter because I'm stressed and I really shouldn't be doing this during finals week and tearing apart my computer, that hard drive's gonna be fine, it'll last. Now, as long as I buy, what, four of them? Maybe a fifth to bury? I'm gonna have pretty good data, data integrity. Now, if all of this doesn't suit well for you, say all of this catches fire, I'm gonna, to I'm gonna tell you what to do after this. So this is the earth, 10 out of 10 would live here again. Now I can store my data on data centers that all have redundant hard drives and I can store them across the world. I can separate it by continents. I can separate it by geopolitical powers. I can separate it by many different things controlling for different factors so that if one of them catches fire, I still have my data in at least two different places really useful. However, if you're really paranoid, you can build a rocket. So this is a rocket. And the rocket has a fire underneath it. And that fire is actually going to be very useful for sending all of your hard drives to this thing in the sky. If you ever look it up at night, you'll see it. It's called the moon. And you can take all of your stuff and put it on the moon and it'll stay there and that's really good and if you don't want to go to the moon i get it it's expensive it's pretty out of date you know we went there once or a few times um 
if you're not into the moon, you can launch this rocket in a way where it circles the Earth. And now you've created something called a satellite. Now, if you're really wanting to store your data, I would create multiple satellites that all check their data all the time against each other. And they all have at least two of your data centers, two copies of your data centers on a single satellite. So now you have four satellites with two data centers each, plus at least three different installations on the moon. And make sure to put one on the back side of the moon so no one finds it. So now you have four different data installations on the moon, four different satellites, and at least three different data centers on the Earth with two hard drives each. Now we're gonna do the math and figure out how many hard drives we need to store our data with integrity. So now we need 22 hard drives. Did the math here, so we got um, two hard drives on each data center. And in that data center, we're going to mirror that three different locations across Earth. We're gonna have four different locations on the moon, and there's gonna be four of them um, on a stationary orbit around the Earth. Um, really great, we're gonna need at least 22 hard drives to have really good data integrity. And boy yo, boy yo. I wanna say thank you for watching this video. If you've stuck with me so far, I hope this gets you to thinking about data integrity and all that. In the next video, we're gonna be talking about this other planet. You'll never believe it. It's called Mars.